My name is Naeem Hashmi. I would like to welcome you on behalf of MIT CIO Symposium. And uh, today we have a very active healthcare panel. And uh, the topic of this panel is healthcare innovation through information and process redesign. If you have gone through some of the healthcare services today, you know how important this factor is. Redesign is the main thing. So to drive this discussion, we have uh, Shahad Shah. He is the moderator. So I will introduce Shahad Shah. Uh, Shahad Shah is uh, an internationally recognized individual uh, in the healthcare IT world. Shahid is a CEO of NetSpective Communications. Earlier, he was the CTO of Cardinal Health CTS unit. And prior to that, he was CTO of two electronic Mac, uh, record companies. And before that, he was the chief system architect at American Red Cross. And prior to that, he was the senior VP of healthcare technology at Comsys. And he's well known at the internet as the healthcare guys as because he runs several healthcare blogs. So with that note, I will pass on to Shahid to take over and start the discussion. All Thank right. You. Great, thank you, Naeem. Uh, Naeem's done a wonderful job organizing uh, this panel and getting uh, the participants that you see here, uh, all the way from John, Graham, uh, Mickey, and uh, Cynthia. Uh, so we're gonna spend uh, as much time as possible getting questions from the audience, and my job is to just uh, keep things moving along. So as soon as you have a question, uh, pop your hand up, and what we do what would like for you to come to the mic, uh, either the mic will travel to you or you can travel to the mic because this is being recorded and uh, they would like the, um, uh, the uh, audio recording uh, to come out nicely, especially for the questions. So just for a show of hands, with a show of hands, how many of you are new to healthcare in general from a technology perspective? A few of you. How many of you here to heckle one of us? because you know so much. <laughs> Just checking, all right. So, and most of you, uh, so is there a lot of expertise, healthcare IT expertise, lots? All right, very good. Um, now, uh, in, in what we're gonna try to cover today, you saw that uh, in general, the discussion started off from the high level of saying, you know, what's gonna happen as we're moving from volume to value, this uh, fee-for-service to an outcomes-driven model. And uh, you see that the uh, topics are around the transformational CIO. And uh, as Naeem mentioned, uh, we are in both desperate as well as immediate need of transformation in a variety of different ways uh, in healthcare IT. And we're gonna try to center that somewhat around the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, accountable care, patient-centered medical homes, et cetera. But please feel free to ask uh, your questions in uh, whichever area you think uh, is important to you because the folks on this panel can pretty much answer uh, almost any question. So uh, definitely uh, consider that uh, we're here to, to take care of uh, the core topics around a few key themes. So I'm gonna kick off the themes and then I'll have the panels, uh, panelists introduce themselves uh, associated with those themes. And then uh, I'll ask them a few kickoff questions and we'll, we'll, we're gonna encourage the panelists to either, e even ask themselves questions um, as well as uh, add to and uh, have a little controversy, uh, a little bit of uh, a push and shove hopefully. So we'll get uh, uh, to more of the truth hopefully and more practical, actionable kinds of uh, topics uh, rather than what you guys always hear at other panels that are probably boring. This one's gonna be exciting and you guys are gonna make it exciting because uh, there was not a lot of booze that I saw out there, just uh, non-alcoholic drinks. So um, hopefully all of that action will come from you guys. So the first theme that um, we wanted to just uh, throw out uh, into the audience, and again, think of these themes as things that you'll think about, uh, potentially to draw out questions is, we, we recently had an emergency in this city and electronic health records have a lot of value. The question is, what is the value of those records uh, during an emergency? Did it make a big difference um, for those institutions? I um, mean, you're talking to, uh, you, you'll be, you have uh, folks on the panel here like John, uh, who was actually operating at a hospital who handled much of that emergency at uh, Beth Israel. So we'll, you know, those are kind of thematic questions to think about and say, well, what, what was the value of IT during that time of emergency? What did we learn from it? Uh, what could we do better next time? So, you know, those would be great questions to ask of John. Now, IT in a value-driven world versus a uh, fee-for-service world, in theory, uh, it seems like that should be very, very different. 
do we really believe that two, three, five, ten years from now, as we're moving to more value-driven care, it, is the IT world, are the technologies, et cetera, really going to be that different? No, it's a good, good uh, things to consider and, and ask of the panel as well. And then uh, the third theme is around next generation patient engagement. We keep hearing, and, and um, most of us uh, speak on panels here, usually monthly or more, more so than that, and all we hear these days is patient engagement, patient engagement, patient engagement, as if nobody's been talking to patients for decades, and all of a sudden in 2013, we'll start talking to them. Of course, that's silly, and uh, engage, patient engagement has been around for thousands of years. We just have not had specialized technologies necessarily, other than verbal communication, written communication, et cetera, with them. So one thing for you guys to think about and ask really hard questions around is, what is the reality around patient engagement? Why is that a big deal? What, what are we supposed to be able to do next year or two years from now or three years from now that we couldn't do today? Uh, so with those three themes, as I mentioned, um, on the emergency side, uh, what, what was the value of health IT in an emergency scenario? Um, and, you know, will IT really change over the next few years from a volume-driven to a, uh, a value-driven uh, environment? And what the heck does patient engagement really mean from a uh, long-term perspective? Is it reality or not? Um, and if you think about those three as the, the general themes all built around this uh, uh, value-driven care model, with that, I'm going to open up uh, uh, just for quick introductions for, so that each of the panelists can describe um, their backgrounds as, as we're going to talk about these themes. And then um, I'll jump in with a few, hopefully, questions to kick things off, and then uh, we'll let you guys uh, jump in as well. Cynthia? Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you in the back, there's plenty of seats up here in front, so I figured I'd do a little just logistics. Um, my name is Cynthia Newstead. I'm currently the CIO of HMS. HMS is a firm focused on healthcare cost containment. So it, it might fall into the buzzwords of fraud, waste, and abuse, program integrity, et cetera. But that's really our mo main focus. Not, not place of care, but how, how expense is being handled in the industry today. I have a history of um, all healthcare. My entire career has been in healthcare, whether it's been large payers, uh, not-for-profit payers, healthcare software, healthcare software startups, um, and now with a fairly significant player in the field. So thank you for joining us today. Afternoon. Uh, my name is Mickey Tripathi. I'm the CEO of the Massachusetts Health Collaborative. Uh, we're a nonprofit professional services firm. We were founded in 2004 as a uh, to run a large scale pilot project that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts uh, funded with a 50 million dollar financial contribution. Actually, one of the visionaries behind that, Carl Asenzo, is sitting uh, sitting here in the room. Um, and uh, we uh, facilitated the implementation of health, electronic health records, uh, health information exchange, and quality data analytics warehouse in three communities in Massachusetts, which led to um, uh, what we are now, which is a nonprofit professional services firm that does uh, EHR implementation adoption work um, in many places across the country, um, consulting services for health information exchange for state governments as well as for accountable care organizations. And finally, we have a commercial quality data warehouse that we um, use used to uh, aggregate clinical data from uh, EHR systems and then provide analytics back to our customers. Oh, I'm good. I, oh, sorry. I, I, have, I have my own. Um, Dr. Graham Hughes, I am the Chief Medical Officer at SAS Institute in a group called the Center for Health Analytics and Insights. Um, my background is that I'm a, a physician from the UK, an internal med medicine specialist, uh, but I've spent the last 20 years in health information technology. at. Um, at SAS, uh, I'm part of a, a group, uh, an investment group that uh, we put together to evaluate emerging technologies. Um, and so it's, a, it's a, an agile evaluation of new technologies group where we're focused on uh, the application of analytics to uh, uh, problems in life sciences organizations, uh, health payers, and healthcare providers, and particularly at the confluence of all three. Um, and so we're a recently formed organization and at the moment are just working on a couple of uh, new projects to evaluate uh, where we think uh, health analytics could be over the next few years. Good afternoon, John Halamka. I'm the Chief Information Officer of Beth Israel Deaconess and its affiliates. I'm also the guardian of the electronic health records of suspect number one and suspect number two. <laughs> and so I could certainly tell you many interesting stories about the last month. <laughs> Great. Uh, so um, 
I'm going to try to kick off with one at least controversial question. Uh, I got into a little trouble last week, last month uh, at, at a conference. I did an interview um, in which I said sometimes uh, the problems in healthcare IT uh, stem from the fact that we don't have uh, courageous enough CIOs that can get around uh, some of their vendors' is, um, impartiality, impart uh, et cetera, and do what is best for the hospital or the customer rather than what is best for vendors. So maybe, John, I'd like for you to you know, tackle that, and of course everybody else is going to jump in as well. What do you feel like with respect to uh, vendors? Are we, are we just kind of following as lemmings uh, where they want to take us? Or are you seeing uh, some courageous CIOs really stand up and say, no, this is where we're going to go, and we're going to pull the vendors toward us and uh, take it away from there? Sure. So I think we're actually at a wonderful turning point in history where policy and technology is no longer owned by the vendor community. We love our vendors. I mean, they're great. But when Judy Faulkner, who is a fabulous person and a visionary for the industry, says, Epic will talk to Epic for free, but <laughs> Epic will talk to anybody else for $2.75 a click, you then have to say, hmm, you know, in the interest of coordinated care, accountable care, safety, quality, and efficiency, there have got to be other ways. So we've actually worked with Epic to think of novel interoperability. For example, Atrius, an 800-doctor multi-specialty firm in Boston, shares 100% of its Epic data with Beth Israel Deaconess and vice versa, and we aren't trapped by any technological limitation. We just simply built a web services technology that allows our doctors in one click with single sign-on and context specificity to get into each other's system. There's literally no friction to that commerce. Sometimes we actually have to work around the vendors. Mm -hmm. So Mickey was part of what we called the golden spike the go live of the state healthcare information exchange of shipping data from one place to another. And we asked uh, you know, Cerner, who is a fabulous vendor, again, very forward thinking vendor, have they complied with all national standards to seamlessly export and import medical records? And the answer is, well, not quite yet. And so we put an appliance on the network of Bay State Hospital so that that appliance could serve as middleware to send and receive data. And the Cerner application simply had to be able to look at a directory. So fine, you leverage what the vendor can do, and with middleware approaches, you will build more functionality. Meaningful use stage two, accountable care, ICD-10, it's actually driving us to innovate faster than many vendors will innovate. And the folks in Washington in Office of Science and Technology Policy will use the term modular and app store for health. And this is actually an interesting vision. Instead of dependent upon the Cerner, or the Epics, the Meditechs, or whoever, great companies, what if the edgy two-person company in the garage could create an app that plugs into and adds functionality to that more monolithic system? And we're working with many vendors to enable these kinds of approaches. Right, and to, just as a follow-up, uh, so you've got uh, you know a, a fair amount of control as CIO uh, within uh, Beth Israel, and uh, you know you're pretty open with respect to open source as you know as a board member on the uh, open source Vista community, especially. Um, do you feel like you are in the minority in being able to do this, or are you seeing that other CIOs? And again, I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like it's an insult or anything, but yeah. either it's a courageous one or non-courageous one saying I'm going to follow where the vendor is taking me versus I'm going to to make the vendor follow me, do you feel like you're in the minority or you see a lot more coming up to, that are doing that? So CIOs, and I mean, Carl knows this, you know, CIO actually says for career is over, right? We all <laughs> hate, we hate our jobs. We can't get through each day. We're right. all suffering. We've been running marathons every day for the last three years. So as I travel the country, what I hear is, you know, CIOs just want to get the job done. And I feel like maybe in the past there was silo thinking or IT was some sort of uh, old competitive advantage. Not anymore. Okay. You know, we are working together as a community, no barriers, no silos. The world of accountable care depends upon us working together because you used to be paid for quantity. Today you're paid for quality. Mm -hmm. You cannot actually survive as an accountable care organization unless you break down IT silos. Great. Mickey, do you want to add, um, you know, the practicality? Like, what, what is the practicality of interoperability? Because if we don't get that, the rest of this stuff doesn't mean a whole lot on the IT side. So where do you see, is the, is the community ready? Uh, we have a lot of work to do, or um, as John is saying, there's, it's, it started and now just needs to be continued. 
Yeah, I, I know I'm supposed to disagree with John, but um, so I'll say I disagree, but I really just agree. Um, so um, uh, the, uh, I think that we're, you know, we're in the middle of a transition, um, and, and that's really where we are, and it's starting to accelerate. But one of the things, and I know there's a lot of uh, folks here in the, um, in the audience who are not from healthcare, one of the things that makes healthcare different than almost every other sector of the economy is that it's extremely fragmented, both on the supply side and the demand side. It's really you know, sort of a craft industry in many ways. Now, some of them are very advanced craft, um, like Beth Israel, but uh, you know, small practices, um, community hospitals, it's, it's very, very fragmented. And so what happens when you start to think about standards and trying to get you know, sort of normalization around uh, whether processes, content, vocabulary, whatever you have, is that there are no big players who can take charge of that. And so unlike what happened with Swift in the financial services industry or Saber in the aircraft industry um, or what Walmart did in the retail industry, um, you know, there are no players like that in healthcare um, you know, who can really do that except for who? Medicare and Medicaid. And so we're now what we're starting to see with the Meaningful Use Program, and for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that was a part, it's a $30 billion incentive program uh, that was funded as a part of the economic stimulus that provides incentives to providers to adopt and use electronic health records in ways that are both from a process perspective as well as from a technical perspective are more you know, sort of standardized. And so as a big player, they're starting to drive the market toward increasing standardization, and I think they're starting to create demand which if, um, in my opinion, you know, one of the things that, one of the reasons that we don't have this kind of interoperability yet in healthcare is because of lack of demand. And it's just what John was saying, that there was sort of a silo mentality before, no healthcare organization needed to think about interoperability, and so they didn't ask for it, whether it's a CIO or whether it's an individual physician. But now, for a variety of reasons, because Medicare and Medicaid are pushing, but also because of customer demand. I mean, it's increasingly consumers and patients expect that that interoperability is going to happen, and I think they're choosing their providers based based on that basis. So um, I think we're going to start to see, based on you know, sort of demand push um, or demand pull, um, starting to see more interoperability. But again, we're in a transitional period. So there's a lot of you know, very practical you know, wrench turning on the ground to, to make that happen. So where we're headed, so normally we as an industry go where Medicare takes us. You guys are doing um, a bunch of work with uh, both Medicare and Medicaid uh, to help with pricing transparency in other areas. So Medicare is talking the talk about doing more data-driven and evidence-driven uh, work. Is, that, is there any walking the walk also happening? Um, well, how do you say that politically, correct? Is there any CMSers in the room? Um, you know, I, I still find that we push policy problems more than we do technical problems, right? So unlocking our data in our own house when we're looking for you know, fraud, waste, and abuse patterns seems to be fairly simple. The technology is there to do it. You can be actually very creative on what you do with the data warehousing and data analytics. Getting the policy to now use that data that you want to do comparison across CMS teams or, you know, God forbid, across Medicaid and Medicare at the same time, I mean, that's, these are year-long legislative actions, and so I still find it's not the technical problems or the vendor issues, it's really policy for us. And while I do think CMS is taking some more forward-thinking approaches on the preservation of the trust fund and how we're going to maintain Medicare going forward, it's still not quick enough for me. So, um, and we're going to grab this question just in a second. Uh, Graham, uh, as one of the vendors who is providing uh, a ton of capabilities, where do you think uh, the users are? So many. So there's a demand problem that uh, Mickey talked about. We know that many CIOs are getting courageous enough to move to the area uh, where we need to be. But I, I get the sense that uh, many vendors uh, sometimes complain that the customers aren't ready for the things that they're willing to provide them. Do you feel that that's happening for you guys? Well, yeah. No, I think I think uh, I don't come across that many uncourageous uh, CIOs as a vendor. I mean, uh, I'm continually being beaten up. But I would say <laughs> uh, the the main issue, as it comes to the area that I'm focused on around advanced analytics, is that the is that the market is immature, the data is immature, the uh, the data, is, as Mickey was saying, is that the data isn't available. The business case hasn't been proven. Uh, the array of potential uses of advanced analytics is so broad that knowing where to start is a, is a very difficult issue. So uh, my sense is that as we recognize that there's opportunity for uh, clinical decision support at the point of care, which is sort of the concurrent decision support you see in electronic health records, blending with what used to be asynchronous decision support that can now be moved into near real time for complex analytics is 
that's a promise, but not something that anyone right now has the bandwidth to deal with because they're so focused on getting their meaningful use money, they're fo so focused on getting the data connected at the Health Information Exchange, they're so focused on their ICD-10 work. And I think that the, you know, we're only starting to see now with some of the more advanced organizations who have a lot of that infrastructure in place, is they're starting to ask the next question, which is, where can my data really tell me? I don't want to just look in the rear view mirror. I want to start to look at how I optimize my organization. That's something that most other industries, which are you know, much more structured uh, and have a lot more control of their data, have been for years. And we're starting to see those questions being you know, asked in healthcare. And I think we're going to see that market take off. Um, but right now, there's just so much federal and regulatory activity that it just seems to me that the CIO is, is kind of running as fast as they can just to stay in place. Makes sense. Uh, so we'll take this uh, question here. And then uh, um, so if you have a particular person you want to point it to, by all means, do so. I'd like to start with uh, John. Uh, year, last year or the year before, you were in Kresge. And as you were describing the electronic health record, I think the number was 400 different standards that existed. Maybe it was more, maybe it was less. Uh, for you and the panel, I've just started doing consulting for a neonatal research uh, firm up in northern Vermont. And I'm from the asset management industry, so I don't even know. Um, I'm just being to learn about this. Where are we with the number of standards? Is anybody doing any <clears throat> either open source or really interesting work around conflating those standards? And um, who has some of the nifty ideas around how to be moving data to and from and be HIPAA compliant? Thank you. Sure. And so anyone work in standards development organizations here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know that there are forest people, there are tree people, and then there are bark people. <laughs> <laughs> and so a standards development organization, and I've worked with many for the last 20 years, can actually spend weeks deciding whether an ampersand or a semicolon is better for a given purpose. We as a country have made substantial progress over the last five years in healthcare, and we've moved to standard form for transport in a secure fashion that ensures data integrity, and that is bi-directional certificate exchange and then the use of SOAP or SMTP SMIME as a means of transporting data. So that's done. It's actually in federal regulation. We've moved quite far in the world of vocabularies. Vocabulary for problems in meds and for labs. We've figured out how to actually codify gender and marital status. You think that's easy? No. <laughs> there are 27 different genders across the world. Very tough. And so that is actually now curated by the National Library of Medicine, and it's open source, downloaded for free, every vocabulary that you need in the United States. Content, we've made substantial progress on. It's not perfect, but when we think of a transition of care from inpatient to outpatient or ED to outpatient, problemless medications, labs, diet, activity, we've created template-based, consolidated clinical document architecture, HL7 standards to do that. Where do we have work to do? You should go Google search on FHIR called FHIR. Uh, and this is a fast hospital information exchange approach that HL7 is taking to simplify the XML. And I know it's kind of weird to say my XML is better than your XML. But it is. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> it used to be that in the world of HL7, you had teams of PhDs creating this XML. It was so complex that standard XML editors couldn't even digest it. And the approach that's being thought of today is, come on. You know, if we're using this for the airline industry or the financial services, do we really need XML this cumber cumbersome and chatty? Let's green it up, make it simpler. And so that's the thing to watch, the FIRE initiative of making what we do on the content side even easier. Well, and let me just add to that as well. Um, not so much on the standards, but the issue is that we find is then on the interpretability. So whether it's the fact that you have data exchange that includes large blocks of text documents that are going to need to be interpreted, or even um, conceptually structured documents that have both the format as well as the payload uh, definitions to, uh, already in standards, the problem that we still have, uh, and I know that John can talk about the work going on in this area, is that there's, 
there's a, still a real problem of semantic equivalence. So the challenge that we have is that a blood pressure is not a blood pressure is not a blood pressure. And so for us to be able to interpret that for the purposes of clinical research, clinical trials, or point of care clinical decision support is to get something that applies across more than one institution is still uh, somewhat uh, in the distance at least for our ana uh, analytic uh, tools. So we have to do a huge amount of data preparation and data uh, transformation to be able to try and interpret those data even, even when standards exist. I go, ahead. I go for an area that still needs some help. So um, I still think the payment side of healthcare is in dire need of innovation. And, and we've done standards with HIPAA, we've done standards with EDI, but it's still literally point-to-point -point connections between the billing and the receiver. And, and imagine when you go buy you know, your Starbucks in the morning, you either have it on your iPhone or your credit card, and you know you're liable for that payment. And that's a fairly simple transaction. Healthcare's not that way. You might be liable for some, your carrier might be liable for some, some might be a write-down, and that complex web of who writes the check is, is very difficult. And, and you know, I, I hope that in my career, I've, I will see us move forward in that because right now the complexity of who pays still is somebody else. And uh, I still think we need lots of innovation in healthcare around that. Yeah, I guess the last point I would make is that, uh, again, just pointing to one of the challenges in the industry that uh, where healthcare is a little bit different, um, but where we are making tremendous progress um, is that um, if you think about, you know, just um, what, uh, uh, what we were just talking about here, that from a billing side, it's a little bit easier to enforce standards and codes because people are getting paid on them, right? So Medicare, for example, can enforce ICD-9 compliance, for example, because they'll literally reject a claim if it's not according to that code. Let's now think about labs. Within this region, there are many, many hospitals. I will guarantee you every single one of them has a different that lab vocabulary in their lab because there is no day-to-day -day enforcement of that. And so we can, even if we you know, say that they should use the same you know, loin code vocabulary uh, or dictionary, tomorrow they could modify it and there's no one in that transaction loop who could actually enforce it and, you know, and, and, and sort of have the lab, uh, the lab dictionary police. Increasingly now, as we move to accountable care and as Medicare and Medicaid start to move that way, we start to have um, measurement, performance measurement, which is based on certain codification. So that's starting to drive, I think, from a bottom-up perspective, again, uh, better use of standards. So we have a data warehouse where we do this. Um, we do it for a variety of provider organizations, but it's a lot of hard work down in the trenches to get people to document consistently and to get the vendor to then do whatever mapping they can do on their end. And then whatever they can't do, we end up doing on our end. And for each clinical organization and for each vendor, it's different. Um, some things we're able to get the vendor and the provider to do a lot. With others, we're not, and then we have to do the mapping on our end. So where is the guy who called here? Well, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, hey, maybe, maybe I can ask the rest of the panelists a question. So, yeah. you know, there's traditional data, whether it's claims data, EMR data, um, uh, administrative data. But as, as we think about the fact we heard this morning about, about socioeconomic behavioral consumer data, credit card data, uh, Twitter feeds, and we're thinking about our highly structured enterprise data warehouses, when does that just blow up? When does, when does your enterprise da data warehouse not manage the structure and unstructured data that, that is available to us as we move forward? So Cynthia, you wanna take that first? Yeah. It blew up yesterday. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, um, I, you know, when I was early in my career as, as a SAS and SPSS coder, you know, I believed in puritanical data structures, normalized, beautiful. You know, the best thing I could do as a CIO is co-location. Get the data somewhere so the data can be analyzed and talked to each other. And so now I don't, I don't think of the data warehouse as just one entity. It's a, it's a collection of data repositories that share across continuums. I'm not taking the time to purify it, if you will, normalize it, whatever you know, data warehousing term you want to use. It's all about co-location for me because there's no way a data warehouse can handle that, that level of volatility and unstructured data coming at us. Of the data. That's right. And I concur that we are not building the canonical perfect <laughs> yeah. schema with everyone for everything. We have a much more federated approach these days. So yeah. example, suppose I woke up this morning and said, you know, I believe people with brown hair get diabetes less often. Well, how do you even answer a question like that? Do you go to the one source of truth in the basement of the White House? Probably not going to happen. However, what if 
I built middleware at each hospital in the United States that understood the concept of hair color and the concept of diabetes or medication equals insulin and said, I'm going to send you a question. Send me back a numerator and denominator. You have a federated network that can answer some very powerful questions. So we've done this across all the Harvard hospitals. Harvard hospitals actually don't like each other very much. The likelihood of them centralizing their data, forget it. But federating queries, already live. Awesome. Um, question? So kind of related question. My name is Ramesh Kumar. I run a healthcare analytics company. You know, Graham, you talked a little bit about where hospitals and providers are having to go through some very basic and important things, meaningful use and various other stuff, ICD-9 and 10. Uh, payers are the one who really control much of the payment, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, or commercial payers. And so we've been trying to see how payers can actually get access to claims and clinical data. Once you uh, connect cl clinical data with claims, you can do a lot more insightful stuff on point of care you know, improvements. When will that actually happen where providers will actually share clinical data with peers? And what other you know, situations when this will actually happen? So Mickey, you want to grab that first? Sure. Yeah, it's already happening. Right. Um, it, it's already happening. We, we don't see that. We, we, <laughs> He does it right now. If you're in Massachusetts <laughs> two years ago, uh, so we send a discharge summary and lab data to Tufts Health Plan, Blue Cross, Harvard Pilgrim. At the encounter being signed, it just goes off to the payer, and it's used for disease management and a variety of other activities. I could challenge right. that a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. So we have talked about this. 10% of uh, data might be shared. Uh, there's a real uh, disconnect between payers and providers because they feel, the, the providers feel that by sharing all this data, we're going to get screwed. And, uh, and I think so, so that's basically what, what's ending up happening is the quality of data is not you know, up there. You can't easily kind of access it. You can't quite do much of the advanced analytics as yet. I mean, the hope is that in the future this will happen, but right now at least we don't see this. Uh, I don't know what your well, experience is. Well, it's that two ways. Healthcare data in general is bad. I mean, that's true. And that is that who is entering our, say, demographics? Oh, that would be the least paid person on our entire payroll at 3 in the morning, and they have to decide race and ethnicity from 27 different choices? That's not going to be a useful data element. You're, you're right. But, I mean, Mickey is already receiving 4,500 transmissions from us every day, and he's doing our ACO reporting, our PQRS reporting, all of our CMS, all of our Blue Cross AQC or alternative quality contract reporting, because it is going from multiple vendor systems into a standard content form over to him. And yeah, you have to do some normalization on the back end, but it's been good enough. Uh, and there are flaws, and as you say, it's some heavy lifting. But I would say every day we actually are tweaking those feeds to make their parsability a yeah. little bit better. Actually, I'll just, I'll, yeah. Um, so, you know, go talk, go talk to the provider organizations that are participating as, as ACOs or bundle payment pilots. That, I mean, I know that's just Medicare data, but they're getting Medicare claims data and a lot of it. Um, you know, you, you start to look at organizations that are participating or, or are working within a state that has an all-payer claims database. You start to look at other uh, data sharing initiatives, and the examples that, that we just heard about are, 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 I think, flourishing and blooming across the entire uh, U US, is that we're seeing particularly, particularly organizations or payers who, who are interested in participating as a, some form of co-equal partner in a accountable care organization or structure that is you know, providing accountable services to a community, uh, very much in their interest then to start to marry claims and clinical data. I, I agree that the, the trust factor is, uh, you know, still a challenge. But there are lots of ways now that, particularly, I'm seeing that the providers are acting as the, um, the kind of the driving force for for collating, not just clinical but also claims data, and, and they're driving the driving the issue. Right. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's what we're seeing from our customers who are now moving forward in accountable care. Some of them have accountable care contracts. Others are acting as if they have them, but they're seeing that they need the breadth. The, the breadth but shallowness of claims with the depth but narrowness of clinical in order for them to get that overall picture that they need to be able to manage risk, which is ultimately what those contracts are about. So Cynthia, you, you're yep. that data too. Yeah. 
too. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say um, I think I think Massachusetts is a very unique situation. I mean, it's it had a community goal, it had a legislative goal, and it had a huge movement behind the suppliers and the demand side of healthcare. I mean, I think it is a very unique case study. I, I don't see it outside of uh, Massachusetts so heavily because you know this had a common goal. You know, I, I sat on the payer side for for years, and I can't tell you how many conversations of can't they just trust us? You know, I'm billing the providers, I'm auditing the providers, you know, I'm looking at them for fraud, but can't they just trust us and give us the clinical data? And it still exists when there isn't a governing community or legislative push, and, and Massachusetts kind of sets itself aside for the work they did as a community, and, and that's not replicated everywhere, and that's probably what you're seeing. Really exactly. There are only 232 ACUs. There's only so many, you know, uh, payers around uh, Massachusetts who are really getting this access and you look across Pennsylvania and all of across the country. The story is quite different. Yeah. Ken. Thank you. Hi, Ken Accardi. I'm with a company called I Get Better, and we help uh, basically keep patients compliant with their care plans in a very engaging way. And uh, so John kind of outlined for us, you know, how do we play in the infrastructure? And basically the answer is that we need to be able to accept uh, an HL7 CDA record over SMTP or, um, or SOAP, and maybe through a health information exchange and that kind of thing. So that, that's great from a technical perspective. Um, but, you know, present company excluded, like the typical um, hospital CIO has spent the last four years of his life with the mindset of, you know, I've got to get rid of all of these systems that are all around and, and you know, get everything into you know, this one thing, you know, whether it's Epic or whether it's Cerner and all that kind of thing. So, so really, I, I kind of wanted to probe into you know, what, what's really going to move these folks. Uh, you know, and even when, when you ask about meaningful use phase two, it's like, yeah, yeah, our, our vendor, they're going to they're gonna push a CDA record out and you know, the health information exchange isn't ready yet you know, and all that kind of thing. And they're just trying to avoid that because they're all about their one system that they've, they've you know, spent so much time trying to get to. So my question is, what, what's going to kind of you know, drive the movement for them to start saying, you know, now I, we've really got to, you know, change the way care is delivered and do a whole lot more coordination of care in order to, um, you know, to improve outcomes and lower costs and all that kind of thing. Because, you know, the typical CIO who's not John that I speak to, you know, doesn't really think that way. And I'm just kind of curious what their perspective is so there. Let me, let me twist that question around just a little bit for you, John. Uh, so part of the work that you do with ONC, especially in your official role uh, on the standards committees, is to make things more modular and not depend on these deep single right. systems. What is the reality, I guess, uh, of how fast that's being accomplished? And could, you, could that be tied to that courageousness again, is being able to sure. say to someone, no, I'm not going to use one single system to rule them all. I'm going to go federated. How realistic is that, okay. I think, is the question. Well, to answer Kent's question directly, meaningful use stage two is a kind of motivator. That's true. But it's ACO formation that's the stronger motivator. Because 65% of Beth Israel Deaconess patients are now in global capitated risk. And we have no idea how to keep patients well. If you're sick, oh God, we of course know how to deal with that. And so what we're having to build is a layer of care management that never existed. We're spending $7 million this year in building the mechanisms by which a non-clinician caregiver could say, oh, I see from this last CDA transmission that Mrs. Smith is a diabetic, but I see from the aggregation of last year's data she hasn't had a foot exam or eye exam. We are going to get that appointment made, or we're going to make that home visit possible. It's a whole different approach to try to survive when you're paid on outcomes and you're not paid for hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. That's what's driving us to open up our data sources. And oddly enough, to answer your question, I am not seeing the big players create these care management platforms. It's actually require utter novel approaches that involve healthcare information exchange, decision support and analytics. I'm sure Cerner, Epic, and Meditech will come up with it. Mm -hmm. Haven't seen it in the market yet. Right. So, Mickey, um, <coughs> what, what will it take? And since we're sitting in Massachusetts, you have a powerful platform that you're sitting on. Um, what does it take to do what you've done in Massachusetts? Was it the fact that uh, we, you went to a, um, an ACA-like system in Massachusetts many years ago, and that's what drove this? Or was there something special about Massachusetts that just can't be replicated elsewhere? What are your thoughts on that? Um, so, yeah, no one else can do it. We're the only ones, so call right. us if you want. No, <laughs> no I, I mean, I think that, the, it, you know, it's certainly got to come up, come from the customers. And, you know, and, and to, you know, to John's point, for example, um, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a need there for that accountable care 
um, uh, from that accountable care goal that you have to achieve at the end of the day. And if you're going to be managing risk, you've got to first define the boundaries of who's in your risk, you know, sort of umbrella, and then figure out a way, first and foremost, to get the information, right? You can't manage risk if you don't have information, and then be able to act upon that. And so we're seeing organizations, and it's not just in Massachusetts. I mean, you know, there are, there are um, with the, you know, the Pioneer ACO program with Medicare, as well as shared savings contracts, you're starting to see, and there's hundreds of those now that are being planted across the country. So, you know, the market's moving. Yes, maybe it's moving more quickly in Massachusetts, but I think it is, I think it is moving. But, you know, these questions of um, whether it's a single platform, um, and you go Epic and decide to, you know, sort of uh, force, I mean, get everyone on to, onto Epic, um, vor versus stay federated, I think are very, very tactical decisions that you see at each of the organization levels. So you have some organizations like partners here in town who are gonna be moving over to Epic and, and essentially um, trying to put everyone on the same platform and try to do, you know, as much vertical integration as possible. And so you'll have a Kaiser, for example, or a Geisinger tries to get completely vertically integrated and, um, and drive everyone to a single platform and, and have that be their, um, their way of doing interoperability. You start to move further and further away from those, you know, very, very um, unique organizations and you start to see that they have to, they have to think about a federated kind of approach. So if you go out to a Bay State Medical Center, for example, out in Springfield, Mass, or, um, uh, you know, or, or, or any other organization where they don't quite have that kind of market power or market leverage, they have an accountable care organization that they want to set up there on Cerner, let's say, but they have three or four large practices in the community who are going to be a part of that. They don't have the authority, um, whether from a business perspective or from you know, any other perspective, to get them to move their platform. So if they're going to take on that kind of accountable care contract, which they're really being forced to by the market, they have to think about federation and, um, and, and, and to work individually with those provider organizations and the vendors to get that done. It's really that compelling need that you know, has really enabled us to you know, get some traction and, and, and be able to provide solutions that, uh, that help them with that problem. So for with the innovators in the room, one of the struggles that they have is who do they go after in these cases? So Graham, if you can talk for a minute or two about um, not, not, uh, not everybody is in Massachusetts, um, but you guys find customers uh, either two ways. One, they come to you and, and they already know SAS and you guys are pretty well known. But what is your advice to the innovators in the room to say, here are the class of users you should go after. Don't just, don't just hope that these customers exist. Fine tune your approach to the market, fine tune and go look for X, Y, and Z for these new innovations. Who, who would those kind of customers be that you should go after? Well, gee, you know, that's, that's a kind of a difficult question. You've got to unpack it because um, innovators, you know, innovative companies are often looking for people who are at that sort of early stage of the, uh, of the market cycle. Those, those people who can take a, a huge amount of cycle time for you, uh, but are also the pioneers. Uh, my, my, my goal has always been to find the pragmatic innovators, and what I mean by that is people who, who have a good business reason to go do something. They're not purely looking at it from a complete academic perspective, but they're, they're looking at it because the institutional buy-in to a particular uh, metric that they're tr trying to move, and whether that's patient engagement, whether it's improving the throughput in the OR, or whether it's improving uh, you know, the, the, the bottom line uh, of their profitability in a particular service line, you find those people, and the, the people who know they've got a gap, they know they've got white space, and you know that you've got a way of filling that white space, uh, prospecting around the fact that you have cool technology is usually a losing proposition. Mm -hmm. Um, let me just quickly go back to the, the previous question, though, because it, it was around patient engagement. And I just, just wanted to say, uh, because I'm not sure we'll get back to that, is, of course, you know, patient engagement's the holy grail, uh, particularly for accountable care organizations, and, and it requires activation of the care team as well as activation of the patient. Um, but uh, the, the one thing I'd say is, you know, go learn from other industries. The, I'm not saying healthcare is like the retail industry or like the banking industry or like the insurance industry, but those those companies would have failed by now if they haven't if they hadn't started to understand how to outreach to their consumers at an individual level. And there is a huge amount of uh, behavioral economics learnings that have been found in other organizations, and there's just been no incentive for healthcare provider organizations to do it. There has been incentive for uh, health uh, plans to do it, but they don't have the trusted relationship that the healthcare provider has. So as accountable care organizations and others who are starting to look at patient engagement, go, go look at the way that you can 
you can manage and automate that at scale, particularly around understanding not only risk, but also propensity to engage and ability to change, as well as other personal preferences, attenuation of engagement, and behavioral uh, issues like that, which can all be managed at scale and not managed by just throwing more case managers at the problem. Great. Neil. Uh, Neil, Neil Wasserman from TimeWave Analytics. Um, following on what you were saying, uh, from the patient's standpoint, the patient wants things very simple. Um, so the uh, American Diabetes Association guidelines for how to manage diabetes are 35,000 words long. The patient doesn't want to hear 35,000 words. It's hard enough for them to engage in the literally thousands of activities that are required to manage their disease. But the medical culture, and I want to ask you know, how you achieve the cultural transformation. The medical culture is very siloed. Uh, more data is better data. Um, uh, we want to understand the effect of a particular drug on a particular disease condition. But from the patient's standpoint, the typical patient does not have just one disease. The typical chronic disease patient has multiple diseases. So for most of the patients who are consuming most of the expense in the healthcare environment, we're not dealing with their case. We're dealing with special cases that have nothing to do with the ordinary case, which requires a very uh, large cultural transformation from silo data to actually addressing the engagement issues that uh, uh, Dr. Hughes was uh, bringing up. So the question is, how do you um, achieve at scale, if you will, uh, a transformation in the healthcare culture that addresses these very core needs that we all understand of simplifying the interface to the patient, addressing the, uh, the real condition of the patient, including the behavioral environment and other environmental factors. You know, how, do, how, how does the CIO play a role in um, changing the view that lots of data isn't the answer, that maybe we need a tidy, tiny data movement that's focused on the patient needs themselves. So, so John, from a ONC Great. point of view, I know that ONC already has started uh, a few committees specifically on uh, consumer patient education material, right. simplifying them, et cetera. If you can talk a little bit of that, and then uh, Mickey can probably jump in as well. So the question is the value proposition. And that is, how do we ensure that patients and families get value from the data we send them? That is, they don't want data. They want wisdom. So I posted a blog yesterday about my father's end of life care and thinking about how if I only had a dashboard that actually translated his O2 saturation, his ejection fraction, his creatinine into a, gee, his cardiac, pulmonary, and renal functions are failing. Red, yellow, green, not O2 sat 73%, ejection fraction 28%, here's the American College of Cardiology probability, you know, that sort of thing. That's value. And so as we're doing this accountable care work, I mean, what we are seeing is new incentives to bring these kinds of patient engagement tools with different kinds of educational materials that will incent good behavior. It's really hard to actually affect change in patient behavior. So let's say it was 15 years ago, I weighed 70 pounds more than I do now, but my doctor threatened me with Lipitor, beta blockers, and ACE inhibitors, and I said, hey, uh, you know, I'll go vegan. I'll be an uh, active guy, lifestyle change, and it, it worked. But my doctor tells me, that's really rare. So what if gamification? We are going to show your weight on Twitter every day. <laughs> and the Y thing scale can do that. Yeah. I bet you're going to lose weight when all your friends are comparing weights day to day. So it is exactly as you say. It isn't big data for this particular issue. It's making it a value of motivating the patient to change based on something a little different than just American diabetes guidelines that are unreadable. Well, I'm going to. I'm going to disagree with that. No, uh, I'm going to. Of course, I would because you know I'm a big data guy, and so what I would I'd agree to a certain extent. What I, what I would say is, you need all the data you can get. And by the way, we don't use half of the data that we could do. We don't use a quarter of the data that we could do to understand patients. We don't even ask them what they want. And I think that what we need to do is, I mean, to what to John's point is, I would say where we should be, our aspiration should be GPS systems for doctors and for patients 
where what we have is we have actually terabytes of information that are being queried about real-time traffic indicators, my preference about whether I want to get a coffee on the way home, what you know, pick up the kids and so forth. And my preference in, in healthcare terms would be you know, what type of person am I and how do I want to interact with my health record? And you reset that GPS system to say what level of information I want. John might actually be the kind of guy that needs a whole bunch of information, whereas I may be the sort of guy that just, that just needs something, you know, tweeted into my uh, uh, iPhone, you know, twice a day without, with just recommendations. So I think, personally, I do think you need, like, big data. You need as much data as you can get but you're going to have to simplify it when it comes down, and you're going to have to personalize it to the individual. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I, the only other thing I would add, um, just to really just augment um, what uh, John and Graham were saying, is that um, you know if we were going to wipe the slate clean, I think that the way we would think about this architecture would probably be more like what they have in India, um, not from a technological perspective, but um, in terms of the model, where in India, where my family's from, um, doctors don't usually keep the records. You, the patient kind of comes in with their paper records and the doctor kind of looks them over and then does whatever they do and then kind of updates them and then says, here's your record back, now you go take it, right? And, if we're, and here, if we were gonna wipe the slate clean with the technology that we have now, that might be more the model. And I think that you know, we probably increasingly want to head toward that model and with certain requirements now as a part of Meaningful Use Stage 2 with, that requires provide organizations to provide patients with the ability to be able to download their information or have it transmitted to a third party uh, a location of their choice, that will increasingly enable patients to be able to be a little bit more control of that. But I think I would also point out that you know, the market's very, very complex. Right? So one of the things that we're seeing, and I know in my own personal behavior, um, I've done this, is the patients start work moving with their feet as well. So more complex patients who have more complex needs, not that I do, but, I'm, you know, but, uh, uh, but others do, um, they start moving into networks where they just get all their care within a network, partly because all the information can be in one place. Right? So my wife goes to partners, sorry John, um, because all the data is there. I go to Harvard Vanguard and I make sure all my care happens within Harvard Vanguard just so I know that all of it's in the same EMR. I think you see people vote with their feet as well because they don't think the technology or the provider organizations are gonna do that for them. I don't disagree at all with what you yeah. said. I, I think we just have to think of meaning from the patient's standpoint as a kind of emergent property of the vast sea of sand out there that is inaccessible to them and should be. Yeah, and if we, if we actually stopped using the word patients, that might help quite a bit as well because I think that what happens is that depersonalizes the whole encounter, whereas we're all individuals who have healthcare needs and I don't want to wait until I'm a patient until I get my healthcare and wellness needs addressed. So there's got to be a whole change in, in mindset, I think, here about the way that we interact with people. All right, uh, Craig, question. <clears throat> Thank you, the Craig Holbrook. I had a two-part question. One is uh, how are organizations organizing around figuring out which problems to attack first and kind of the efficiency equation? And how are they putting teams of scientists, doctors, statisticians together to solve those problems? It seems like there may be 10,000 diseases out there. There's a few that are million-dollar diseases, but where do you start? Um, and the second question is, are you considering open sourcing the data to allow entrepreneurs to really help you to understand there's this slice of population that if we did things differently, we'd have better outcomes? So Cynthia, um, what do you guys do with the, the data? Is it all yours? Nobody can see and touch? <laughs> um, right now, yes. So uh, this is, you know, I uh, was just chatting about this earlier today. Privacy is such an enormous wall for us, right? Because each of us wants to keep our data private, right? I, I don't want my weight tweeted. Uh, I might want my steps tweeted because then I'm moving towards a positive direction. But it's such a private, siloed, personal thing, it's hard to get over that privacy hurdle. Now, when we take a step back and say collectively, how best could we serve this community here in this room by sharing that data? Would, be there, would there be entrepreneurial looks at the insights? Absolutely, I mean, anyone that's been in academia can say, oh, that's just rich. I think until we get to the point where a patient is the owner and they feel enabled by saying, I opt in, you can have my data and it can be shared, I don't think we're gonna have that massive movement because companies, especially ours, can't force Openness. Data and make it available on the internet. Um, we can uh, not because of our data use agreements. So because uh, we're a third-party intermediary in the in the industry, 
We have very strict data use agreements for both CMS, Medicaid, commercial plans, employers, and they don't want their data shared except for this particular region. So the whole community has to lift forward rather than a personal yeah. stake. But there's value, absolutely, that could be shared. Is the, are the organizations, hospitals, and payers, are they organizing cross-functional teams to attack certain slices of the population? So, so Mickey, you guys are running a, uh, a shared data warehouse. Uh, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I mean, don't tell John. He sends us 5,000 records a day, and we just put them on the internet. So. No. Is, there, is there a wall between John and the rest of the panel? But, 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 so, so, but let me actually explain what uh, Mickey and I are doing together because it illustrates the point, is that we're working with an edgy entrepreneurial company, and they needed 1.5 million encounters in order to build a model that would be predictive with reasonable sensitivity and specificity. So what do we do? Is we actually devised algorithms to go in and remove every name, gender, date of birth, zip code, everything that can be construed as an identifier. Oh, but in the middle of a note it says, this famous Massachusetts senator was drunk again. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so this is the problem that you face, is that no algorithm that we can devise will ever read through every line of every note and remove context. So even though it's de-identified, what Mickey did yesterday was put the 1.5 million records on a one terabyte encrypted hard drive, hand delivered it where it's now in a locked room where it's gonna be destroyed after the modeling is run and it's de-identified data. Right. That's the problem. Yep, yeah. absolutely. I, the, other, the other thing I would just, just that was in your question is I think, um, you know, there's a whole spectrum of maturity and needs out there. So, you know, what a Beth Israel needs and is willing to do um, is very, very high end, right? Top of market. They've got very sophisticated analytics that they want to apply. You know, that we, I mean, we don't do all of that, right? They have a whole bunch of stuff that they do internally with their own scientists. Um, whereas you go to a community hospital and they have, you know, very basic needs around analytics. And so there's a whole spectrum there. And I think that, you know, that's what we're going to start to see as the market matures is more of a spectrum of capabilities that can provide analytics for organizations at the level of maturity that they're at and, not, and do it at a price that they can afford. Third parties, though. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, a community hospital like a Lawrence General Hospital or a Lowell General Hospital isn't going to build a team like Beth Israel can build internally yeah. to do that kind of thing. The other thing is that uh, I, I think it was part of your question is this idea of, you know, as you, as you start to go beyond building boundaries and that you're looking at continuity of care uh, as accountable care organizations need to, well, how do you choose, how do you figure out where to focus? And some of that is on being able to understand variability as well as price or, or so what, what are high cost activities? not just within any individual setting, but across settings using data from you know, both claims as well as health information exchange. Because then the idea is, where do we have high variability, potentially avoidable waste within the system? Yeah. Which, which of these areas is high cost? And then how much is high volume? So that you, organizations we're starting to work with are saying, how do I look at that? Not just from a hospital perspective or from an ambulatory perspective, but how do I look at it for um, contiguous episodes that are meaningful to a patient and that may, we may contract for in future, but that they're sub-ACO level. So what are these kinds of episodic bundles where it makes sense, and how can I understand care variation and potentially avoidable waste? And then what I'll do is I'll target my analytics in there rather than targeting my analytics on my eczema patients where you know there's very low variability and, and the overall impact on total cost yeah, is low. Yeah, the manufacturing industry has tackled this through lean technique. I would assume you're going to end up applying lots of lean across the spectrum for the process piece of healthcare. So another way to answer your question is our accountable care organization is employing techniques, as Mickey described, to forecast who will be sick in the future. Just because you were diagnosed with something today doesn't imply you're gonna spend money in the next year. Ah, but three years from now, God, things are gonna go nuts. So what we're doing now is home care nurses are beginning visits to people in their homes who in the future will be high cost patients. Thank you. Yeah, that's terrific. All right, we'll take, uh, we only have a couple of minutes left. Did you have a question or were you just gonna stop us? <laughs> so we'll I'm take... going to stop now. Yeah. Yeah, no. uh, I would just like to thank you everyone for, for a wonderful sharing of the knowledge. And I would like to give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, everybody, and especially to Naeem. He organized uh, this whole, the whole panel, got everybody together, so let's give him a round of applause as well.